Um, this is uh, part two of our art morning. Oh, I'm so, I, Mrs. Shore would be so proud of me. I can also ask where the bathroom is, but I don't like the answer because I can never understand it. Um, uh, Dean and I had the pleasure this summer of taking a class at Sitka, as in Oregon Coast, not Alaska, um, and um, did a, had a wonderful workshop with a local artist uh, dealing with cold wax. And we so enjoyed Lynn that I decided she'd be a good person to speak to us. One of the things that I know we, we talk about in art is contrast and texture and line and blah, 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 all those words. But what do they mean? How do they really, you know, what, what, does, what does it mean to have those elements in some kind of a piece of work? And I was so impressed with the way Lynn explained some of that, that um, we've invited her here to speak to us about the elements and principles of art. She is um, an artist based in mostly in the Oregon coast, though she teaches um, all over the place, including McMinnville. She has degrees from Linfield College and Pacific Northwest College of Art. And I hope you will enjoy this presentation from Lynn Wintermute. Thank you, Jinx. I'm going to move this over in just a second, but um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you a little bit more about the elements and principles of art. I do, however, need to apologize for those of you who are strong supporters of Willamette University. As it mentioned, I did go to the other absolutely wonderful small college in Oregon, Linfield, and I want to deeply apologize for thumping Willamette 77-0 last weekend in football. <laughs> so, <laughs> moving on, moving on. The things we're gonna talk about today are not just in art, although I'm an artist, I'm not a musician, and the cello was 50 years ago, so. <laughs> and, but many of you are musicians, um, actors, dancers, photographers, poets, and so many of the principles and elements apply to you as well. So since you have that expertise that I don't have, uh, think about it as we're going along. We'll talk about, about that a little bit more. But the elements and principles have been around for thousands of years, and they really apply to more than just the visual forms of art. So what are they? Make sure I don't forget one here. Okay. Everybody hear me? Do I have the microphone in the right place? I hope. I have a booming voice. Um, so the principles of art are rhythm, balance, emphasis or contrast, proportion, gradation, a couple of different names for that one, harmony, variety, and movement. The elements of art are line, shape, form, value, space, color, and texture. Um, I got to hear a little bit of the last speaker, and I was seeing those elements of art in um, Betty LaDuke's uh, paintings. Color, line, shape. You've just had a great introduction to what I'm going to talk about, so I really appreciate that. Thanks, Jinx, for planning that person ahead of me. Um, so, how do you, um, how do we describe the uh, elements and principles? Um, understanding and applying the building blocks of arts, art, um, as they apply to the visual artist. Um, the elements take a master, or take the master from being a beginner to a master. Um, this is important because you need, if you're an artist, you need to understand how to critique your art, for one thing. If you, um, in order to practice your art, you need to have a deep understanding of exactly what it is that you're trying to paint. And when you get stuck, and I'm sure there are lots of artists in this room, some that I know, when you get stuck, if you go back to the elements and principles, you'll say, oh, of course, I don't have a focal point. I don't have contrast. And it 
just how it's a wonderful, wonderful tool that everybody needs to know about if they're going to be an artist. Um, it, uh, the concepts need to be understood in order to build on them. This gives an artist fluency, um, and it gives art lovers, if you are not an artist yourself, knowledge. After studying this, it'll be fun for you to uh, look at the museum here, look at the art that you have in your everyday life, and pull out some of those elements and principles. It'll help you understand this as a, um, even if you are not a working artist, it'll have you give you a better understanding of art in general. Uh, the elements are the toolbox that we use as artists. Um, you use one, you combine many. As, as I'm talking about the paintings I'm showing you, I'll say, yes, that has line and shape and texture. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a good, fairly good understanding of what that means. Um, the principles are how you put them to work. So not all of these things will apply to other mediums, uh, but many will, or other art forms, but many will. Uh, the principles are where style of art manipulates the substance. So the first painting I've uh, brought is uh, obviously a Monet water lilies. And I put this up here because Monet did so many water lily paintings and they became more and more abstract as he got older. And, um, and of course he lived with this in his backyard and I know some of you have been there. Um, I'm envious, I have not been. But um, he was an absolute master at using light, which of course the Impressionists were, that, that's why they were called the Impressionists. Um, but this painting in particular also uses balance absolutely beautifully because the bridge is balanced. It uses focal point because your eye goes back into the landscape. In most landscapes, and you're going to see that in many that I show you, they tend to be darker in the front and then go back to a very light spot. But Monet also made them darker on the top so your eye is drawn deep into the painting. It has texture, but it's implied. Um, it, it has beautiful color. There's um, just enough dots of red in it, which are hard to see, but um, dots of red in it to give it color contrast and make it pop. It does have shadows, lights and darks. You can almost feel the grasses and, from this painting. So let's talk a little bit more about color. Color for me as an artist is probably the most important thing that I work with. Um, I tend to paint things that have a lot of color in them. I'm not as interested in black and white, although I'm kind of getting more interested in it. So what is color? Color is hue, value, and intensity. And what does that mean? Um, hue is the color itself. Um, the primary colors and everything in between. I always have a color wheel up when I'm painting and I hope that all of the people that take classes from me will have a good understanding of the color wheel and how it works. And I think we all learned the color wheel when we were in grade school. Um, however, I've had experiences where I've been teaching in a foreign country and introducing children to um, the primary colors and how to mix them and they kind of think I'm doing magic tricks. It's pretty cool. So, <laughs> um, Value is the hues, lightness and darkness. And of course, it changes when you add white or black. However, we just looked at a Monet painting. Monet did not use black. He uh, used combination of colors um, to get a very, very deep green, a very, very deep purple. Um, I, I think there are very few instances when he actually used black to give that, um, that value to his paintings. Intensity, the um, brightness and purity of the color. Um, of course, many people worked in, from the very beginning of painting, in oil-based colors. And that's because of the brightness and intensity that you can get in oil-based colors. These days, acrylics, which are actually, actually a plastic, um, can get almost the same intensity. It's really quite amazing. Um, in examples of intensity, if you're a musician, 
and you're thinking um, a, a piece that builds in intensity. It's almost red hot um, the way that it builds and and um, and then can can cool right down. Um, if you're a writer and you're writing something very passionate, that's kind of like the color red too. Very intense, very warm, very passionate. So um, I have a a girlfriend who, um, an artist who, uh, all of her paintings are based on sonatas. So she sees art in music and is able to translate that. Obviously she's a musician as well because I, that is totally beyond what um, I could ever do. Um, so talking about color, I said that it's very important in my work. This is an oil and cold wax painting. Um, uh, Cold wax is, is not encaustic. It doesn't use blow torches and heat and chemicals. It's uh, almost like beeswax and, um, and you mix it with oil paint and you get these really wonderful colors and textures. This painting doesn't have a lot of physical texture to it. It's implied texture, but um, by using the oil paints, the colors are very intense and very rich. This also has line in it. It has focal point, a lot of other things that we're going to see. I've been painting in oil and cold wax for about two or three years, and I'm kind of hooked on it. It's like painting with frosting. Um, this painting also has balance and harmony, um, hopefully. <laughs> Of course, it's one of mine. I'm hoping it has all that. But if I get stuck in a painting, I will go to all of these things and say, do I have balance? Do I have harmony? Do I have a focal point? Do I have enough contrast? Next, we're going to talk about line, another really important thing in painting. Um, line is obviously marks made on the surface of a painting. Um, many refer to it as graffito. Um, loose lines. Uh, you've heard of cross hashing and hashing, um, and there are many different kinds of line. Um, they can be two dimensional, they can be three dimensional. A line is a point moving in space in l length or direction. It creates space. A line outlines a contour, giving it a subject and a space. Um, it describes form itself. It moves the eye around a painting. A line can be vertical, horizontal, diagonal, straight, curved, angular, bent, thick, wide, thin, blurred, fuzzy, controlled, or meandering. And line is used in so many paintings, not all, but so many. So it's an important element. This is an example of, um, of a piece that I think uses line quite well. This is a 1931 painting called Fall Plowing by Grant Wood. And you can see that the line is moving your eye around the painting. It's taking you deep into the painting. If it wasn't for the line, your eye would not, I mean, look at all the lines that are going back, way back to the focal point in the back, which is quite small. But it also is the lightest, brightest, and the lightest and brightest color whites are leaning your eye right to the back. It also helps your eye meander around the painting. It's kind of soft and fluid and pleasant to look at. Without line, this painting would, would really have very little. Form. Oops, get to the next page of my notes here. Um, Form renders a three-dimensional form into two dimensions. I think you were talking about form at the end of the last talk, and she was uh, doing pieces that were very strong on form and shape uh, that were quite wonderful. Um, the form is really the heart of the art object. Um, it encloses volume. Uh, it includes height, width, and depth. Um, for example, um, a cube a sphere, um, a cylinder, a triangle, a pyramid. Um, it can be direct form, uh, all of those examples I just gave you, or it can be very abstracted and free-flowing. It can enclose a space 
determined by line, color, value, and texture. This example is a Paul Klee uh, painting. It, um, it, it's very easy to tell what the form is, obviously. Um, there are triangles, circles, lines, squares, boxes, rectangles. Um, it has a um, great line. Uh, because he has used black in to very delicately outline parts of these paintings, especially around the eyes and the eyebrow, um, as well as a little bit that it's it's very fine. You can't necessarily see it as well in this in this photo, but um, it it encloses the space. Uh, you see texture, um, and of course the use of color is fabulous in this painting. Uh, this next painting is one of mine, and it's totally opposite. It has very little form. It's very abstract and loose. You still kind of know it's an abstract, I mean, a uh, landscape. Um, you might, because of color, think the bottom is, is water. And uh, maybe there are mountains on the left. Um, maybe the sky is very purple, but it's, it's very abstract and loose, almost fuzzy. But it does have a focal point. If it didn't have the white dot in the middle, your eye would not would flow all over the place and you'd be confused. It also has a lot of texture, and this texture is actual texture that is put on in the early layers of the painting. Uh, so when you see it, it really is very thick with texture. Um, shape. Usually a shape is enclosed. It's where the line connects to itself. Um, shape is usually two-dimensional. Um, it can be flat or limited to height and width. It can be organic and it can be geometric, very much like what we were just talking about. But a geometric example of shape would be this painting, and I'm sorry, I don't know who the artist is, but. Obviously, it has circles and triangles, uh, shape on shape, circle on circle, color, contrast, line. It, it's very much a, a study in, in shape and geometry. And boy, does it have a lot of movement. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. And remember about this when we talk about movement, because movement comes from repetition. And you can see that there's several places where lines are repeated, and they, they move because of that. Space. Space is the element that in which both positive and negative areas are defined. Usually, the subject is positive, usually. Usually, the background is negative, usually. But there are rules are meant to be broken in art. Um, it can be 2D, two-dimensional. It can be three-dimensional. It can be shallow or deep, closed or open. The distance around, between, and within a space of art is considered the space. It can be above or below. It can be the illusion of space that can be uh, created by perspective or shading overlapping scale. It can be distributed with an optical, or distorted, I'm sorry, with an optical illusion, or by an optical illusion. I've got a couple of examples of space. Positive space and negative space. But I think that's kind of an interesting example because are these two faces? Or is this a vase? By being positive and negative, it gives you two totally separate paintings. But really, they're the same painting. It's just using positive or negative. When I first saw it, I saw faces. I think we tend to do that. But then after I looked at it further, I saw a vase, a black one and a white one. What do you think? <laughs> Good question, right? <laughs> Um, this painting is um, using 
space in a very organic, abstract way. Um, it, your eye goes to the lighter shades, and they're very blurred, obviously. <clears throat> Many layers of paint on this. And because of the fact that they're kind of starting where the blue is, the only place where the little bit brighter blue is, everything looks a little different from my computer when you put it up there. Um, your eye goes there because there's blue, black next to the blue, next to the white. So you've got your lights and darks and your color. But then your eye picks up the white and moves it up into the painting. Um, so your eye is moving around. Um, you have the darkest darks on the side and the bottom, which is typical in landscapes, and your lightest lights going up into the sky. This is pretty abstract, um, and it's an oil-cold wax painting again, but it, it does have a subject. Um, can everybody easily see the landscape in this? But it is distorted, isn't it? And um, it is made of shapes, and uh, color really leads you through this one, I think. Um, a lot of shading, a lot of deep colors and light colors, and perspective. And the perspective is pretty much implied. Texture. <clears throat> now this is something I use a lot, but many painters don't. Um, this is the way an element uh, or an object or element feels, uh, a fuzzy sweater. Um, or the way it would feel if it was touched, a, um, a, a rock, very smooth and cold, or a blade of grass that can be warm or cool and sharp or, or soft. Um, implied texture refers to surface quality. Um, does it imply to the curve of a rock or imply or to the uh, blade of a, a of grass. I think that's how it's used by the artist. Um, texture can be very smooth. It can be a painting with no visible texture. And I think that it's more typical from the old masters to have paintings that didn't have a lot of implied, it didn't have a lot of texture. It, it may have been implied, but you didn't see it. It wasn't, um, the, they didn't paint heavily necessarily. Of course, again, there's just such a huge variety, Variety, it's impossible to tell. Uh, it can be simulated, um, invented texture. Uh, it can be, uh, that would mean a texture that's created to look like something else. It can be subversive. So it can uh, fool the eye texture. We see that a lot in decor. Um, where it creates a realistic illusion of texture and depth. Um, subversive texture contradicts your past visual knowledge. Um, you experience it by using, um, or the artist experiments it by using texture in a um, unexpected way, generally. So this is, is this painting? Are these rocks? Does, um, does it have real texture? Or is that implied texture? From this, it's pretty hard to tell. You know that a rock is very, very smooth, right? But all the texture on it, is that taking away the smoothness? This, this painting is, uh, or is it a painting? You know, it could be just rocks that are painted. Pretty hard to tell. Um, this piece uses a lot of rhythm and repetition as well. And what's interesting about that is that because it uses rhythm and repetition and because of the way the lines are curved, it carries your eye around the objects. So it could be totally flat. It's just that because of the lines and the texture, your eye is fooled to think that it has a curve, because you know rocks generally are not flat. So that's in your mind. You have your eyes being fuel, fooled um, with a flat surface, and because your knowledge um, is that rocks are curved. Another example, everybody knows what this is. Um, 
Van Gogh is, is somebody I, I absolutely love, and I think most everybody does. It's hard to believe that he didn't sell a painting in his lifetime, traded for a couple, but didn't sell one. This has become, of course, a standard, one of the greatest paintings ever painted, Starry Night. Um, some of the things we've been talking about are so evident in this painting. I would say maybe number one is color, um, texture. Now, he painted impasto, which it means that it's thicker. Um, so there really is texture. He used thick, long brush strokes. He was a post-impressionist, where Monet was an impressionist. And Monet painted with shorter, short, quick brush strokes. He finished paintings in a day. So did, did Van Gogh. It's hard to believe if you've tried painting something like this in a day. It's, uh, there's a lot of work goes into it because of all the brush strokes. But they're fairly thick. They have a lot of movement. Um, there's a lot of contrast, a lot of whites next to blues, a lot of yellows next to blues. Um, and then there's this interesting cypress tree in the front of this. And why is that there? Um, that's there because of balance and contrast. The, um, the moon in the top right is so bold and bright that if, it, if there was not the big dark uh, form of the cypress tree on the left, it would just, your eye would just go flying off the page. It wouldn't work. Now he does have the curves that kind of bring your eye back onto the page, but by, by giving it the securing the painting with that cypress tree, it secures the whole painting and the balance of the painting. And the subject matter, you would think would be the village, but you hardly can see it there. It's, remember what I was saying about dark in landscape in the front and very light in the back? This is a perfect example of it. And when you go out and look at the landscape, you really do see very dark forms and colors in the front and lighter ones in the back. Of course, this has a huge amount of movement, um, rhythm, line. Uh, notice, it, yeah, I guess you can see it. Um, all the little village houses are um, surrounded by black line. Um, to Otherwise, they just completely get lost in this painting. Um, and there's a lot of black line in the cypress tree and, of course, a lot of line in the hills behind. Um, wonderful painting. So next up is rhythm. And we're seeing rhythm in this painting, absolutely. Um, you feel as though those clouds are really flying by. It's a, it's a windy day. And um, the, it, but there's also beautiful rhythm in the tree and in the hills. And why is that? Because of repetition of line. Um, rhythm describes the movement in or of an artwork. It's um, created by repetition, as we just talked about. We talked, remember that very geometric painting that I showed you? It had a lot of repetition, which gave you rhythm. Um, obviously, rhythm is used in music as well, and dance, and so many other things. And in, in poetry as, to, as well. Um, <clears throat> the elements all come together to create a visual tempo or a beat. And that's what rhythm is. And go back to look at that quickly. You can really see the rhythm in this painting. I guess that's how people can write, uh, paint, do a painting based on a piece of music. Um, again, Van Gogh. Um, the, the, <clears throat> the loose strokes, um, the emphasis on the the blackbirds that give it movement. And the blackbirds, because there is the black in the sky, the movement of the birds is just carried right up into the sky. You can see them. They're on their way up there. Um, the contrasting colors, uh, the horizon. I do think it's kind of interesting that he has two really light forms. Normally, I would think that when you're doing balance, you would want to have two, you'd have three ones, threes, and fives. 
generally in art, but it works obviously in this piece. He's also got two, two roads, maybe three going off. And you can tell again, he's a master in making things move. The grass is moving um, and, uh, and it's implied texture, but it's, it's very dominant texture. Um, and the next, next one we're going to talk about is harmony. And I think you see harmony here. And, and I want to talk about that for a second because his use of color and his use of very loose shapes um, gives the whole painting harmony. If he was to go in and do a straight line, this it would blow the whole thing. It has to be loose and it has to all have the same overall look. And that's the harmony of the painting. The elements of artwork, oops, next. The elements of artwork that come together in a unified way. If your painting is not unified, if your um, dance is not unified, if your um, sonata is not unified, then it's not going to be, it's not going to work. Um, they can be uh, certain elements that are repeated, we've talked about that, um, but they have to still look and feel similar. Not monotonous, that wouldn't work either. Um, not chaotic, and I, you could almost say this is chaotic, but is it? It's got the rhythm and, and uh, the harmony of, of shapes that are similar. So it doesn't, it's not chaotic. I don't find it as chaotic. I find it quite beautiful. It, energetic, yes, but not chaotic. Um, it's harmony is a perfect combination of both, and it's really hard for artists to get. Um, it can be a way of combining similar elements achieved through the use of repetition, as we talked about, but also subtle, gradual changes in a painting. Um, this painting is a um, uh, oil and cold wax landscape. Um, as with the painting before, there's kind of a rule when you're painting landscapes, and it's the rule of thirds. Because if I was to put the horizon right in the middle, it would not be pleasing to the eye. It would not work. You, with um, landscapes, they work so much better if they are in the top third or the bottom third. And that's kind of the first rule you learn when you're painting landscapes. But I'm using contrasting colors, and this is obviously abstract and heavily texturized. But it, because the colors are all within the same range, it has harmony. Um, it's, it's really thick with texture, too. So making that texture work in a painting is not always easy. And balance, we've talked a little bit about balance. Um, a combination of elements that add a feeling of equilibrium and stability to a work of art. Um, balance is symmetry. It's asymmetrical. It's, it can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. Um, those are the things that are the manifestations of balance. Um, without balance, a painting does not please the eye. And an example is this one. Anybody know what this is? The Ghent altarpiece, a very famous old painting uh, by Van Eyck. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, but this is a wonderful example of, um, well, focal point for one thing. The um, lightest uh, robes on the right, one on the left, balance. Wouldn't have worked if there wasn't one on the left. It wouldn't have looked right. The robes in the uh, angels in the middle, and partly because it's curved, going straight up. See how your eye goes straight up into the, um, the, the lamb and straight up to the sky, the lightest light. It's amazing. And then even the whites on the sides all lead your eye, and of course the rays, um, right back to the lightest light. So it's, it's got a fabulous focal point. It has great balance, lots of texture and all of those beautiful robes, whether they're actual or implied. Um, 
uh, contrasting colors, the greens and the reds and the white, really, uh, it, there's a little bit of blue, but it's only three colors in this. Um, it's just, it's very, very old, of course, but it's a, a great um, example of the elements and principles. Repetition, movement, balance, color, so many pieces. Has anybody seen this in real life? I'm sure that it was is absolutely wonderful. Um, contrast, and we've talked, I've been, keep bringing that up because I think it's really, really important. Um, contrast is uh, where your focal point comes, uh, as in the last painting. Contrast can also be called emphasis. The elements and principles have several different names that they use for each category. So um, I'm using the ones that are most commonly used, but uh, contrast can also be emphasis or focal point. Um, it um, refers to the arrangement of opposite elements. Um, it stresses the difference between the elements. Um, they can be light and dark, or large and small, or rough and smooth. Um, they create a visual interest um, in your painting. It, they create excitement and drama. Without emphasis, your painting is painting is going to be pretty boring. And this is a photograph, and I don't want to forget photographers because um, there's absolutely, I'm trying to give you examples from lots of different mediums. Um, I, I think that this one is wonderful. Of course, it has the light and dark, the chiaroscuro. It has movement, and but it also has still areas. It has a focal point. And that's where the lightest light is next to the darkest dark. It has, it's hot with the, the deep reds and oranges make this really warm. Movement. Now, is the movement fooling the eye here? Because we know that fish move. Um, or is it partly because of the curves? Uh, what gives this movement? Do we, we know that it has movement though, right? Um, this example, one of mine, um, obviously contrast uh, in the light and the dark, but the background is um, many layers of underpainting that I've scraped and <coughs> dug into to give just a little hint of, of color. And they tend to be smaller scrapes and digs, so they're, um, they're in contrast to the big, bold shapes. This one is almost breaking the rules though, which I, you know, I make mistakes all the time. It's a little too close to the center if it's going to be considered a, a landscape, but is it? Not really, it's an abstract painting. Uh, movement, we've talked a lot about movement, creates the look and feel of action, guides the viewer through, viewer's eye throughout the piece, as does line. Um, it can be varied. It can be have repetition, and it can be made with gestural mark making. Uh, this is a wonderful black and white pen and ink painting, and I think it's a great example of contrast, line, rhythm, and value, the lights and darks. Pattern, we keep talking about that, uniform repetition of an element of art and combined elements, anything can be turned into a pattern through repetition. This is a Piet Mondrian. I think that this is an interesting example because obviously there's pattern here and there's repetition, but there's also space. If this painting did not have the blank space, it would overwhelm your eye. It would be way too much. And part of that is color primary colors that are bold. If it was all color and, and geometry and shapes, it would be way too much for your eye to handle. You need some place for your eye to rest in a painting. Proportion, I'm running out of time already, um, is the relationship of elements to an artwork in the whole and to one another. Um, it's not the overall size of a painting, but um, it's the scale and proportion of two objects in a piece of art. Um, or sculpture. 
Has anybody seen this one? It's in the Minneapolis um, Sculpture Garden, and it's a Oldenburg, and it's called Spoonbridge and Cherry. And uh, it's a great example of pop art from the 60s. Um, the spoon is may maybe a little big for the landscape. <laughs> Cherry might be a little bit too much to handle, but um, isn't it wonderful? And um, this is a great example of, uh, it's out of proportion with the land completely, but it has shape and emphasis and color and, um, I just think it's a really fun example. It's really fun to show you something that's pop art as well. So the, oh, I'm ending right on time. Hey, there's hope for me. Um, as we talked about in the beginning, be thinking about how do all of these principles and elements work when related to music? Are many of you musicians, I'm sure? Some musicians, any? Buddy, oh, I see, yeah. So does this kind of, can you kind of associate this with, with music? And poets, what about poets? Ah, poets, yes. So repetition, emphasis, and poetry, absolutely. Um, are you writers? Do we have writers? Yeah. So I've listened to a lot of speeches recently, and um, some are good and some are bad. And there's um, emphasis quite often. Um, almost a focal point in the written word. Uh, there's repetition. Um, dancers, uh, you guys all dancers? Come on, come on, fess up, dancers. Um, certainly this can be used with dance as well. And actors, um, that's just another one of the arts that can use so many of these elements and principles. Um, I've tried to go over it pretty quickly for you, um, but we made it. 1220. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. I know it's hard right before lunch, so I, and thank you for inviting me. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is Roz. Uh, I was sitting here uh, listening as you define the elements, kind of relating it to photography, because I like to do photography and particularly how I edit photos uh -huh. and saw, you know, a lot of things I do and could do better. So thank you for that. But a, a professional photography friend told me one time a, that negative space in a photograph, and this is, you know, assuming you can you're composing it or maybe editing it after the fact. Negative space should be minimized. Like it's kind of wasted space and, and really? like an example could be sky. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have too much sky maybe. But so could you talk a little bit more about the role or value of negative space and how it might relate to blank space that you just I can't remember I, if you called it blank, but where you had the white, you know, to rest the eyes, right. that kind of thing. Um, I, I think that it's not that it needs to be de-emphasized or it shouldn't be used. I think it just needs to be balanced. So if you have a very strong color in, um, or if you have just black, negative space is black, that needs to be balanced with white, which is coming forward in, in most cases, depending on the, I mean, every painting is so different. But I think it's just a question of balancing a negative space. I think a negative space is really important. It can rest your eye. And a painting that has no place for your eye to rest is going to be very difficult to really enjoy. So I, I think negative space is important. Um, I wouldn't shy away from it. I, in fact, I'd use it. Yeah. <laughs> Does that kind of answer your question, I hope? Hi, this is Pat here. Hi. I'm, hi. I'm wondering, uh, are there any well-known artists who don't play by the rules? And, and do they do it just because they can? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Wait, uh, could you explain that just a little bit more? I didn't quite catch all of it. Yeah, I was wondering, is there any well-known uh, artists, painters, who normally don't play by the rules that you've given today. Ah, 
Yes, of course. There are some painters and great painters that they, it's intuitive to them. They just know it. They don't have to study it. They don't have to critique. They just do it intuitively. Um, and those are people like Monet and Van Gogh, and I mean, there are many. Um, but for most of us, normal human beings, we, we need to check ourselves. I think that I've only been painting, I mean, I painted in college, obviously, and, but then I had a you know, legitimate career for 40 years. So I've only been painting for um, six years. And um, I, I needed to retrain my brain from college in order to get comfortable with the elements and principles to try to make my painting successful. For me, it's not as intuitive. It's getting much more intuitive the more I paint. Um, so I, I, I think that it's, it's something everyone can learn, and it will become part of your toolbox. But yes, some people just born with it, can just see it all just there. Um, this is Solvay. I, I'm wondering if Pat meant, is there somebody who will not play by the rules, like Jackson Pollock? Oh. Oh. <laughs> and yet they become famous. Is, is oh, that you know, it's interesting because my husband was asking me that last night. He said, how do you explain Andy Warhol? How do you explain Jackson Pollock? How do you explain some of the, the very, very abstract paintings out there? I was showing him a painting that I really loved and he just did not get it at all. And yeah, Jackson Pollock's a great example. He uses color, and he uses rhythm, and he uses pattern. But there's usually not a focal point. There's usually not, I guess there's some balance. There would be balance. Um, one part of a painting could be very light, one could be dark. But there are so many things that he is not using. Yet, people love his work. They find it pleasing. They see that it's got a lot of pattern and rhythm. It really does have a lot of the elements. So um, not in a traditional way, however. <laughs> obviously. Does that kind of answer your question a little bit, hopefully? <laughs> yeah, well, so here I come again. I'm sorry, I didn't see a hand just now, but I think it's very nice that you, uh, I mean, it's okay for you to use so many terms for music for, for, your, for, for your medium. <laughs> I mean, we, we just thought we owned line, harmony, texture, <laughs> rhythm. Um, well, I was sitting there listening to you and just put together a whole lecture about what piece of music I'd, you know, I would use to, to show all of those elements. And of course, you know. Yeah, it's not exclusive to visual art I by any means. So. <laughs> by any means. There are a couple of questions here. I don't think. Oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to mention something about the uh, Van Gogh painting. Yeah. Um, what I saw was just a lot of, uh, you talked about balance. I think it was out of balance. Oh. I mean, because I think it was definitely an uh, internal process that he was projecting on this paper. It was, uh, and he, in fact, it turns out he was mentally ill, but he was able to, in today's age, it, he would be considered that. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but he was able to use his art, you know, to use in, his, uh, as a way of expression and uh, personal expression, which obviously was amazing. I, I'm not minimizing that. How, how could I? But just the color was just like, uh, to me, it just looked like it was so much of many of his paintings seemed to be so much movement that it almost seemed like he was out of control somewhere. well well he was mentally ill he did they probably power, were too. out of control but i see exactly what you're saying because the sky is very large and bold and uh totally out of balance with the village below it but the village below it was a minor part of the painting but i can absolutely see exactly what you're saying. I mean, the, the, the cypress tree makes more sense because it's in the foreground, but the sky is out of balance, absolutely. And, but the painting still works. It's a great painting. Yeah, there was, yes, 
Yes, this is Irene. I just wanted to thank you for showing your paintings. Oh, <laughs> and I love I the colors mind. and the way uh, very abstract. But you know, they all have a special um, balance. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you. you, thank you. That seems like a, a pretty good climb uh, ending. We have we've pretty much run out of time. Um, this has been so fascinating, and we thank you so very. Thank very you. Much. Thank you.